evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to air conditioning. For those of you who have been outside, and of course, welcome to the first in our enrichment lecture series. Our lecturer this evening has been a featured presenter at United Nations, at the very prestigious Explorers Club, and at the Society of Naval Architects. And today he is here just for you. He's one of Silver Sea's favorites. Ladies and gentlemen, a nice round of applause for Captain Richard Heyman. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, and uh, welcome aboard, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be on this cruise with you, which is uh, not your average destination because you're really going to the end of the world around this tip of the world, let's say, to the farthest south land in the southern hemisphere. And, of course, we're starting up here in the big city of Buenos Aires, and I hope you had a good time in this uh, rather bustling town of Buenos Aires. We just pulled in this morning from Montevideo, and so uh, off we go north east to across the Rio Plata to the other country in this, this delta of uh, Uruguay. And um, I'm going to tell you about uh, Uruguay on this trip, but then later about uh, the, the natural features and wildlife of Patagonia, and then about uh, the Falkland Islands, and then Cape Horn, and uh, Straits of Magellan in, Ch in the Chilean fjords. But we are now in the most urbanized part of this uh, region of South America, of which Montevideo is sort of uh, the twin uh, city of this area. And let me just step up here and I'll show you some pictures of it. Uh, how many of you actually been to Montevideo before? All right, so you may, you may correct me if I mispronounce it, but uh, anyway, Uruguay is a country that is on the north side of the Rio Plata here. It, uh, this is a, a, a kind of a hilly land. It's not does not have great forests. It's mostly ranch lands. It is a small country between Argentina and Brazil and Paraguay. And uh, the history of this country was that it was it was rested between these larger countries, and it might have been a province of either Brazil or Argentina had it not fought for its independence. But now it has about three million uh, and a half people in the country, making it much smaller than the 190 million in Brazil and. Um, the 112 million in Argentina. So it's kind of a small country that's on the, let's say, the uh, outwash of this great river system, the Paraguay, Uruguay rivers, after which the country is named, come down and form the Rio de la Plata. Now, this um, river is uh, it's actually a large river system because there are all of these numerous rivers coming down from the great Pantanal and then from the lower uh, southern edges of the uh, Amazon watershed then coming into this vast bay, which uh, was called the Rio de la Plata because it was the place where the Spanish went to ship out all of the silver from Bolivia. But it is a muddy estuary. And you can see that um, right here, there's a uh, delta land that has a lot of channels and sort of mangrove and brush in that area. But Buenos Aires is this giant city here that is spread out into the, starting to get out into the Pampas. And Montevideo is right here on the edge of where the fresh water is coming out into the seawater, into the great estuary. But this uh, piece of water is as big as Holland. It's, as you can see as we go sailing across it, it is a river that you cannot even see the other bank here as it sort of spills out into the Atlantic. And then Punta del Este is way out here in the fresh Atlantic waters and clear seas. Now this uh, river that we're crossing has some fish in it, but it also has a tropical dolphin, the Rio Plata a La Plata dolphin, it's called. And this is a fairly small and a, a toothed and a beaked dolphin, somewhat like the Ganges River dolphin. But it is, like many of them, including the Yangtze River dolphin, which is now extinct, a, an endangered species because of all the pollution and the ship traffic uh, that confuses them and the fishing and too many people around, like in all other river systems. But here's a juvenile that was rescued on a beach, and they're trying to uh, protect them now. But as we go out into the ocean, uh, there are all these islands off of Uruguay and as we go further south. So one of the uh, sites there, if you take the boat trip out to, from uh, Punta del Este is out to Isla de Lobos, which Lobos refers to Lobos del Mar, which are the sea lions. And there are the largest colony in the world of seals and sea lions on that island. There are some 250,000 of them around this island and a few little islets. And, uh, a few days ago, I went out there and uh, on the small craft and went around the island, and, and it does smell like 250,000 seals. 
but it's a great sight. I've never seen such a remarkable display of them. They look like pigeons all over the beaches here. It's actually a, um, a very big lighthouse that is the gateway to come into the Rio de Plata. And they, they're, uh, they're just everywhere. And there's just so many fish that are in this estuary and on the shore here that uh, it's can support that big a population. We'll see more down as we go down to the Falklands and uh, to the Straits of Magellan. Well, here's the Uruguayan side of the Rio de la Plata, and there, it's uh, characterized by these cliffs and then a series of mountains. And then as you come in to the river, it, uh, it's mostly plains, but uh, Montevideo got its name from one of the mountains that is right at the harbor. And the name itself actually means, I, I see a mountain. It's supposedly, it was said by one of um, Magellan's crew. But here's the city of Montevideo. It's like Buenos Aires. It just sort of goes up the hills and spreads out into many neighborhoods and then goes along the beaches. But we will be going into the old harbor, which is here. And then the old harbor town port with the shipping terminal is on that tongue of land. And you can walk into the main downtown center, though that is just a fraction of the larger city of about uh, one and a half million people. It has a regular transit to Argentina. The Bukibus, which you can see in Put, uh, Put, uh, Puerto Madero right here, runs across to Uruguay and then also goes away to Montevideo. Uh, and these two countries are very, um, some way similar population. Uh, their, their style of Spanish is very similar. And then they uh, have a lot of trade back and forth. And especially the Argentines go to Uruguay for the beach vacations in Punta del Este. Now this is the mountain of the monte, or the hill that Montevideo uh, has. And this is a, just a little view of the, uh, the harbor as we'll come in. And note, uh, it's a very narrow gap. Sometimes the Rio Plata has uh, winter storms and has a very big chop in it. So the, all of these harbors have breakwaters. But this one has an old steam tugboat sitting on its breakwater, just in case uh, we need an extra push to get in or out. And uh, it's also very tidal, so you'll notice at the dock when we're in there, uh, just, just yesterday the tide was very low because of the full moon lately, and there are all these beautiful old wrecks along the uh, breakwater. Not of any ship I've ever driven though, I assure you. But here we go, this is our harborage and our, our, our dockage. Again, it's a container port. And uh, for all of the interest of these cities of Buenos Aires and Montevideo, what they have not done is separate the cargo from the cruise ships, so that's why we're, we're always being shuttled between around all these boxes and because of port security now, you can't go walking around unless you, you know, take, a, take one of those boxes home. But uh, then you get off into this big terminal, which is the standard landing for all these um, decades, because Montevideo, like Buenos Aires, back in the days when you only could get here by ship, this was a big deal to arrive finally in this part of the world, South America. And then we we'll go out through there and then into the old town. Now, this is a fairly compact walking town, um, a lot more convenient than uh, Buenos Aires. It doesn't have all those uh, grand boulevards and great seas of traffic in the way of uh, walking off the, off the pier. And so in the Ciudad Vieja, the old town, we you can walk to the port mark, which I recommend, and then up to the two squares, Plaza de la Constitución and then the Independence Plaza. And there's a lot of old buildings in this area, uh, many of which are not in very good shape. I'll just show you. But when you get off the base, uh, what I always like about South America, you always have a Navy patrol and a contingent and a few warships there just to make you feel safe. So here's a young sailor that may be there to greet us. And a view from the downtown. This is a very big, uh, this used to, this building right here, which is the uh, Edificio Comercial, which was the tallest building in South America in the 1920s when Montevideo like Buenos Aires was a very prosperous New World city and, and building uh, its uh, iconic architecture. Uh, then there's the city sort of goes all the way out along the beaches and into many neighborhoods. If you take one of the tours that gives you a city tour, you'll see that there's some very lovely residential areas on the waterfront in many parts of the city. Uh, but in the old town, it's not in very good condition. Now this uh, country was, of course, uh, Indian uh, native territory of the Chorua Indians who were very much of a kind of a plains people living in the um, flatlands. They were not in the, uh, let's say, deep in a forest like in Brazil or mountain people like you get in the Andes, but these were um, hunters and gatherers in the neighborhood and they were famously not very friendly to the Spanish and the first uh, Spanish came, uh, Juan Diaz Solas, in uh, 1516, and he landed and tried to um, baptize him, and they returned by having him for dinner. Uh, but nonetheless, he 
was followed by many more uh, Spanish uh, con conquerors. They enslaved and fought and then finally ex um, subjugated the Chihuahua Indians like the Guarani and many others in the neighborhood. I'll speak about the ones in Patagonia on another day, but what this what this did, though, is the, um, the subjugated uh, survivors of the Chirua were uh, taught to ride horses, and they became very good horsemen. And then they m mixed in with the Spanish immigrants. They became the gaucho, and they be had that kind of um, Wild West uh, capability of uh, horsemanship. They used their bolos, the, uh, the kind of uh, stones on, the st on a st on string that was a, a charua and a native practice to catch this, a rea. Uh, and uh, that's still a gaucho quality. And so um, in the countryside in Uruguay and also in the pampas of Argentina, this is sort of the, the cowboy tradition that is still uh, very much vaunted with a lot of s uh, music and poetry and literature about the independence and the strength of these uh, cattle vaqueros in Spanish, but they're really gauchos is a, is a native Indian word for this in Argentina and in Uruguay. And so, uh, for instance, uh, Uruguay only has uh, some three and a half million people, but it has um, some five million cattle and 18 million sheep. So its major product is still uh, beef and lamb and, and wool and then other grain and agricultural products. So if you take one of the tours out to an estancia for a horseback riding and or uh, sheep shearing and then a lunch out into the uh, countryside, you'll see this life that goes on. So the gaucho always has an open stirrup and then he has a flaco knife, which is for shearing and for defense. And uh, one of the sayings was, it's a, if you're a gaucho, it's better to be killed in a knife fight when you're drunk than to die peacefully in bed. <laughs> That's the way you ought to go, but not, not allowed on, on this ship. So you have a lot of horsemanship and then this is, uh, Oh, well, it's a typical tradition, Spanish also, of course, the original origin, but they have um, what they call Semana Criollas, which are the um, displays of the countryside skills that they have in uh, exhibitions and rodeos in Montevideo City every year, and this becomes a competitive rodeo uh, like you have in the, the North American uh, plains. And so I've, I've seen some of these uh, great quarter horses cutting cattle and then roping them. It's, it's done differently than in uh, North America, but it's still a great uh, uh, art of the equestrian kind. And this young kid is training with training wheels in the city, but this is, this is right downtown. He, he doesn't really get a horse yet, but that's the monument to the gaucho in old Montevideo. And they even have uh, caravans with gauchos that I don't know if, if the gauchos live with their horse in this or the horse pulls them around town, but this was again right downtown Montevideo. Another thing you'll see here, you may, have, you may have already seen it in Argentina, but it's really in Uruguay, this uh, yerba mate, the tea that they drink, which is in a cup. And it is a kind of a holly plant that's indigenous to the plains of this part of the world. And then they uh, put hot water in it and sip it all day. And it's not very caffeinated, but it is a, um, it sort of has a, uh, a mild uh, sensation to it and it's very calming. So you'll, you'll see, especially in uh, Montevideo, in Uruguay, um, usually the men are walking around with a cup all day and they have a little uh, metal straw called a bombilla. And so this is uh, a, one of the native Charua Indian uh, traditions that's continued on to this day, but it is said that the Charua used to drink out of the skulls of their vanquished enemies. Again, not allowed anymore. Of course, that's like the Vikings. The skull means skull. But um, you can, in Montevideo, you'll see this uh, all over the place. They're selling the mate cups and bombillas and a packet of yerba mate. It's very good. It's sort of a mild uh, tea. But if you really want the full flavor, you should get one of these. It, you know, it tastes a little, uh, you know, sirloin tea, I guess you'd call that. But uh, don't, don't give it to your vegetarian tea, si tea sipping friends, though. So anyway, this part of um, South America was what... Um, right on the line of division between the Portuguese and the Spanish Empire because in 1501, Pope Leo X kindly divided the world in half between the Portuguese and the Spanish in uh, the Treaty of Tordesillas. And that line came so many leagues west of the Canary Islands and that came right down the, uh, the mainland of South America, meaning that Brazil is, speaks Portuguese and everything to the west is Spanish, except those pesky English and French who snuck in. Pardon my Amglish. And uh, 
this part of Uruguay, though, was fought over between them. And the Portuguese got there first, and they set up a thing called uh, a little fortified town called Colonial de, de Sacramento. And that is still there across from Buenos Aires. And there's, a, I believe there's a tour excursion to there. It's about a two-hour drive from Montevideo, uh, though they have uh, bookie bus uh, catamarans that come from Buenos Aires. And this is the best preserved colonial town in this whole area. And it has a drawbridge. That's the um, code of the seal of uh, King Manuel of Portugal, and then uh, the intact churches and lanes and buildings of that era. So it's a very beautiful colonial heritage site that's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But Montevideo started to develop as a commercial port like Buenos Aires and bringing in immigrants uh, from especially Spain and then more so even from Italy later. And then in the contests in this part of the world as the, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars when of course, Spain was conquered by Napoleon, that created conf confusion in the New World because their home c country was no longer uh, independent and then they all declared their independence all through South America. And so the liberator San Martin led the armies to, uh, uh, against the Spanish rule from Venezuela down to Argentina and is venerated uh, to this day. Uh, and his tomb is actually in Buenos Aires at the, at the cathedral, if you saw it. But meanwhile, the British came in and invaded Uruguay and, and took Montevideo in 1807. And this is fondly remembered by the Uruguayans because this meant that the uh, Argentines didn't control Uruguay. And then later, Uruguay formed an alliance with the British to maintain their independence and not be conquered by those Argentines across the river. And this man, Jose, uh, Jose Gervasio Artigas, is the founder of the country. He fought against the remnant Spanish loyalists. He, he made an alliance with the British, which to this day, the British government and the Uruguayan government are still very close. Uh, but he, didn't, he passed away before there was the full independence of the country. But this country, Uruguay, had its uh, constitution written in 1830 and is the oldest continuous democratic government in South America, has only been interrupted by a military junta once briefly in the 70s. And this is right in the uh, Plaza de la Independencia downtown. I, if you're walking around there in this great plaza, I recommend going and looking in. They have a very small museum in that building that's just uh, open to the public and it has uh, many a uniform and a sword in it, let's say. But you can get a flavor for the feeling of the Uruguayans that they would otherwise not be an independent country had they not had this um, initiation of their nation as independent and, let's say, compact and small. And sometimes uh, countries that are not that large get along better with, within themselves and don't have the troubles of larger nations. Now, I live in that, that big thing in the north called United States, and I, I have no opinion about the size of my country. But Uruguay is a fairly peaceful and stable and now economically prosperous country, probably just because it isn't too big. It's been growing at about 7% uh, um, in, in economic terms recently. But it is always dependent on the trade and the port of Montevideo. So here's the, uh, the downtown area in the early 1800s. Um, there was some conflict over the countryside, and there was a period of um, internal conflict as they were setting up the country. And they had uh, two groups of landowners called the Blancos and the Colorados. Uh, fighting over who was going to run the government until they set up a formal democratic constitution. And so the Colorados won, and to this day, if you go in the downtown, you'll see that red band on their hat comes from the founding of the country, and that's the ceremonial guard at the presidential palace right there downtown. Now, again, this is a, an old map of uh, Montevideo, and this is the old city right here. And it used to be, oh, just a broad bay, the mountain across over here. It has a kind of a castle up there that you can go visit this day, but uh, the, the, the nation grew very prosperous with the trade to Europe, especially uh, exporting, uh, again, mostly beef and grain. Uh, to this day, actually, uh, Uruguay uh, produces the most kosher meat in the world for Israel and still has a very busy trade. And then many immigrants came in, and uh, of course, Argentina grew much larger because there's a larger land mass. But the next ship that came in, you may know this story. This is back in 1939. The German pocket battleship, the Graf Spee. You may have seen a movie or heard about this, but this is a, uh, a point of still great interest in Montevideo, because there is a museum, a Navy museum, that has a lot of its artifacts. And I'll, I'll just tell you this uh, history in short. When uh, after the Treaty of Versailles, the Germans were not allowed to build 
ships of over a certain tonnage. And so it, instead they built a very lightly constructed pocket battleships, three of them, that had very heavy guns on them, and the Krupp guns were the best in the world. They also had advanced radio and sighting uh, mechanisms. And this ship was sent down to be the South Atlantic Patrol, and then when the war broke out, it started to sink British shipping. Here's its launch in Vil uh, Vilshofen and its uh, commissioning. It was considered the, the best battleship of the era. Uh, and it uh, was, it had only a two escort vessels, but it sank nine merchant ships in the first weeks of December 1939. And then it, um, was pursued by a British squadron based in the Falklands. Now this is Captain Langsdorff and his young crew who were very well trained and they, even though they would be out, uh, outnumbered by the British fleet, the single ship of the Graf Spee could defeat any ship that got near. It had longer range guns and better sighting. And so uh, you can imagine the German sailors were happy to be down in the South Atlantic rather than rolling around in the cold North Atlantic and they had a, a fair time until the war broke out, <coughs> but then they were pursued by these ships, the Exeter, the Ajax, and then the Achilles. And here's Winston uh, Churchill coming to visit on that when it was up in the, in the UK. But um, in December 17th, 1939, the British fleet found the Graf Spee and they had a battle off of the Rio Plata and the Graf Spee fired, disabled the es Essex but it was damaged by shots from the Ajax. And one of the shots came into, hit the funnel, went down, and, and damaged the engine room, and especially the, um, the heating system for the bunker fuel that then would be heated enough to drive the engines and give full speed to the, to the ship. And, my, and uh, the Graf Spey Captain Langsdorff realized he better go in for repairs, even though he didn't know if he could fix the ship. It was, it was more seriously damaged than anybody knew at the time, even his crew. So the Graf Spey came into Montevideo. Uh, Uruguay was a neutral country. And by the law of the sea at the time, any warship could only stay 24 hours, refuel, reprovision, and had to go back out to sea. Now there was some diplomatic uh, um, arguments in, in Montevideo at the time because they could see the ship was, was damaged and there were 37 German sailors who had died in the, uh, in the short battle out at sea. And so the German ambassador asked for an extension. It was given 72 hours. And then the British ambassador protested and said the ship must leave. Uh, and it was a standoff that was got in the papers and it was uh, the first major naval battle of World War II. Meanwhile, there was a funeral for the German sailors. They took their dead and they buried them in a ceremony. And there's a graveyard in Montevideo just for them. Uh, and then th the ship was then taken out of the harbor and scuttled with three charges and sank right outside Montevideo. And now the, the uh, shoreline was filled with spectators and the world's press had come up here to see what was going to happen. They thought the ship would go out and have to do battle. And the British Navy, the Royal Navy, was coming in with more vessels from Brazil and the Central Atlantic to finish off the Graf Spee. But Captain Langsdorff realized that he could not make speed. He had damage to his um, crew and the uh, operations of the ship. And then he kept uh, most of his uh, crew on shore. He went out with the ship with a skeleton crew, laid the charges, got off, and the thing sank in the mud. And then it rested above water for quite a while, and then it slowly has been sinking ever since into the mud of the river. And this uh, was a great shock to the uh, German Navy, of course. This was one of their greatest ships, and suddenly it was not there anymore. And it's still to this day not known whether Langsdorff got orders to scuttle the ship or he felt that he had to because otherwise he would lose it at sea in battle and lose a thousand or so of his crew. But especially he did not want the British to capture the ship and then have access to its uh, advanced uh, sighting and other communications equipment. So there it settled down in the mud and Langsdorff went to Buenos Aires and the crew were given permission to live uh, in, in uh, Argentina for the rest of the year for the rest of the war. They, they, they did not go back to fight in the north. And some have said that Langsdorff actually did not like this war. He did, was not a member of the Nazi party. He thought that it was a crazy idea, perhaps. And he wrapped himself in the Navy flag and, and, and killed himself 
at an office at the uh, German Embassy in Buenos Aires. And so to this day, though, he has a um, contingent of Germans who live in Argentina who still venerate him for his decision. Of course, had he gone back to Berlin, he might have been punished or sent off to worse battles. And his sailor crew that lived and stayed in Buenos Aires in their own neighborhood um, met until perhaps even there now there may be still some that have an annual reunion and they still venerate um, uh, Captain Langsdorf. This became, of course, uh, big news around the world in a film. And uh, I guess who is that played in Anthony Quayle? I went and Peter Finch. I don't know how good their German is. Mein ist nicht sehr gut. But now the ship is still there and it is marked on the charts. It has been settled down, and um, I have a, a colleague who's a hydrological engineer, and he proposed that a caisson be put around it, and there be clarifying of the water, and it be available for glass-bottom boats to go out and visit it, and make it a, a not a scuba dive, but a, a viewable site, because it's only in seven meters of water, and you could look down on it if you could get near it. But it has uh, been uh, somewhat salvaged by the, ch uh, the Uruguayan Navy with the the, pla the bow plaque and then the conning tower and other artifacts, telephones and different things have come, come up. And there's the anchor for the Graf is right off the dock. When you get off and go to the entrance at the uh, Montevideo Pier, you can see it. And also the great sighting range for the guns are, it is up and restored now. Uh, well, we proposed this to the, uh, Chile uh, to the Uruguayan government. But the Navy said it's too dangerous to even get near because it still is full of munitions. And one of the charges did not go off that were planted. So they're afraid that anything that would be done around it might disturb the wreck and it might blow up again. So they rejected the proposal. But just yesterday, as we came out, we could see the last bit of the, the marker and the tower that still is above the water. You may see it as we go right into the fairway into the harbor of Montevideo. And some of the guns are off, and there's the Naval Museum that has uh, some artifacts. But nowadays, the waters are peaceful, and it's uh, fortunately the terrible wars is just history, even though it's an interesting story. But Montevideo is a port, of course, is a very busy place. You'll see it's like Buenos Aires. The economy is actually fairly good around here. You could walk off into the old port, which is uh, typically of some of these old ports, uh, not exactly the, the most charming part of town, especially in the evening. And so many a sailor got into trouble. Not me, I assure you. I've never gotten any trouble anywhere. But if you walk off in the daytime, I don't recommend it late at night, you can go to the port market, which has been restored. And there's this beautiful um, iron building of 100 or so years ago with uh, restaurants and shops and uh, an open air market. And that's actually a very charming part of the town. Uh, of course, what they feature are uh, uh, meat appetizers, meat uh, dishes, and more meat for dessert in the local style. So they have open grill asado where they are grilling grilling everything up for you. Uh, in other parts of the city, they have um, some of the old colonial neighborhoods, Barrio Sur. They also have uh, uh, some um, African heritage people that are Portuguese speakers, like in Brazil. But this was a country that did not have slavery. These, these have actually moved down into the area. So there is a bit of samba, and you will feel a bit, little bit different than Argentina. Uh, but they mostly have uh, the Spanish culture. And the tango in Uruguay is said to be even more fun than in Buenos Aires. Here, I'll just give you a little more view of the Plaza de la Constitución. You can walk there in about 15 minutes from the ship. There will be a shuttle bus up to the other square. And if it's a nice day, they put out a flea market around this plaza. Uh, and there are a lot of old buildings in that area that have been um, in very rundown condition. And they increasingly just tear them down. So if you need a doorknob, it's a good place to pick up a few. Here's the plaza, the Independencia. That's the, the shuttle bus will actually come up here and stop right in there, this commercial area right there. This is the great statue of Artigas. That's the uh, Cabildo, the, the, um, the hall where the um, Constitution was drafted. And that's the museum I mentioned. And here's one of the old colonial gates when the town had a wall around it in this area. There are a few ruins of that early time, but not much. This is just the one that's on that plaza when it was the only part of town and all of the government offices were right there. Now most of the modern business is further out of town. But here's the statue of Artigas there next to the commercial building. And below that, though, is his tomb. When you go down some stairs, and then there's this rather somber a uh, subterranean tomb with his ashes uh, and an honor guard for him. It's not a very um, 
um, <coughs> cheerful tomb, but uh, that's the center of the national founder. Uh, across the other side is the Teatro Solis, named after the first Spanish discoverer, and that has classical opera and symphony, things like this. There's the Catedral Matiz, which is designed by a Portuguese, and it has um, a lot of almost pa uh, Pantheon-style uh, ornamentation on it. Again, it's not in very good condition. Um, uh, Montevideo has sort of had booms and busts economically, so they have uh, some new buildings and then a lot of old ones, and then uh, much of it is not in good shape. There's some modern sculpture. Uh, also downtown is this Museo de Az uh, Azulejo, it's uh, the Portuguese-style tile. But if you go just walking around this area in the daytime, you'll see that a lot of the old buildings have been abandoned. And this is somewhat of a shame because this was obviously a very prosperous part of town. Families had businesses and residences, but um, a lot of this old hardware and doors are now being salvaged and sold off. And for some reason, the government and also the local community is not saving many of these buildings. And part of it is that they have a lot of public housing in, uh, on one side of the old town, and uh, nobody wants to be down there. So this is unlike many a fine European port town or other parts of the Americas. They've not preserved it very well, and there's a lot of poor people right down in the neighborhood. And the wealthy have moved out to their estates and their lawns out, out of town. So here's a graffiti. Enough of these starvation wages. Well, actually, uh, Uruguay is doing better than than uh, Argentina these days. But here's another house that was just torn down. It says, Muy Triste. Very sad that uh, they made a parking lot out of an old house there. There is some money that came from the EU and Spain, though, to restore some of the major landmarks. So you'll see some things are getting fixed while other things are falling down. Um, they're also typical of this part of the South America. They're old cars that run around as taxis. They somehow make parts for Model T Ford still down here. And so you'll see these around town. That's sort of a pride of this area. They keep these things going, partly because the weather's so good. Uh, and then I'm going to finish up by showing you a bit of Punta del Este, because the next day we'll go down the coast to this famous resort, which is sort of like the Miami Beach of South America. And at the height of summer now, when schools are out, it is full of people. And this is a, a point of land that is out to the eastern part of the sea with a lighthouse, again, that uh, calls ships into the the great uh, delta, the Rio Plata. And all of the houses around the lighthouse have stayed family low buildings, while everything else is getting built up into high condos. So if you have a chance, with the, the ship will anchor, will have a tender, and then you can just walk around that neighborhood right at the tip, and it's actually very lovely right down there. Most of the beach and the crowd are up further out, uh, up, up the shore a bit. There's this big marina, so there's a lot of boats here now this time of year. And just the other day, we had private vessels being our tenders so that they'd have more of them available running constantly back and forth and uh, check your schedule to see how long we're there. Uh, when we were there the other day, we were there till 10 in the evening, so you could have dinner ashore. And if that's the sailing schedule, that's uh, something to do there. You'll see the uh, nightlife as it is just waking up. And of course, we'll sail away before you get into trouble. Here's the seaside, which is, has Atlantic surf rolling on the riverside, uh, it is much uh, calmer, and so that's where many of the beaches are. And uh, you'll see the full display of the, of the wildlife of Argentina that is up there. Now, the Uruguayans uh, host a lot of Brazilians, a lot of Argentines who come there because they have uh, casinos in Uruguay. Uh, and, other, uh, and other things that uh, one of the local Ur Uruguayans said, they, we do things that they don't allow in Brazil, but he wouldn't tell me what that was. I mean, what isn't done in Brazil? I couldn't, he wouldn't tell me. But um, anyway, there's a lot of families there this time, a lot of kids running around. And then there's some, I think they're called penguins. Those aren't penguins. <laughs> well, you had to check. But here's a mermaid, yes. Uh, there are other kind of uh, creatures on the beach. So Punta del Este is sort of a, a fun place, and if you have enough fun, you get a free baby carriage. Uh, and here's the landing where we, where we uh, come in, and um, it's a very lovely town, boardwalks. Right off the dock, right where we come in on the tender, there's a fish market, and in case you haven't had enough to eat on board here, you can buy some fresh fish there. And there may be these fellows come in to have a nibble, and sometimes you can't Get, all, get down the docks, because I think now this high season, they, they push them back in the water, but they're fairly aggressive. These are the sea lions that come in from the islands just to have a free snack or else to watch the other wildlife. I'm not sure. But they're very tame and no, no problem. And so cute. Of course, they're overdressed for the weather. Most of these visitors, though, are in big hotels and big 
um, condos. Uh, it's become a very prosperous town, Punta del Este, because of the prosperity of certain parts of uh, South America. Now a lot of Brazilians come down there, but it's mostly Argentines. And then people f come from around the world of this resort area. But uh, um, it's boomed, especially since, if you know, 2007, the Argentine government defaulted on a hundred some billion dollars in national debt to international banks and so they could build more resorts in Punta del Este, I think. But uh, I don't know if it happened in this building. There's a story uh, that happened a couple of years ago where a Brazilian couple came down to have a good time in Punta del Este and the man went out f for a drink. He came back, found his girlfriend in bed with another man and picked her up in a fit stark and naked, threw her out the window, 15 stories. And she was s screaming and f flailing, and a photographer took a picture of her, and it ended up on the front cover of the local paper, The Flying Brazilian. <laughs> and, of course, she fell to her death, sadly. But then they, this the guy won a photo contest for snapping the picture of her, and, of course, it had a little, a little black stripe here and there on it. But then the police came and confiscated his camera as evidence. Meanwhile, the Brazilian guy and the the lady's lover disappeared. That's the sort of thing that happens in Punta del Este, but it's not on the tour. Anyway, but it's a beautiful town and we'll have a good time there. I, again, I recommend walking in the neighborhood because you get a feel what this place was like when it was just a pleasant end of the world without a big crowd. There's some unusual houses. This is sort of Uruguayan, Gre Grecian style, I'd call this. And if you uh, go on the outside to Maldonado tour, there is a fantastic building called Casa Pueblo that was uh, built by an artist named Carlos Paez Villaro in 1960. And it, is, it keeps building out as a sort of cascading sets of terraces and uh, swimming pools. And it's open to the public as an architectural monument. But also, you can buy a unit if you like. And it's a very unusual building for this area, amongst many others along the coast. So Punta del Este is a very beautiful resort in this uh, unusual part of the world. Enjoy the beach while we can, because as we go south, it tends to get cooler. Uh, and um, even in the s warm and sunny Falkland Islands, they don't quite have the same kind of uh, uh, wildlife as they do in Punta del Este. Now, this is a, the famous sculpture, El Mano, by a Chilean artist that is right on the Atlantic side beach. And um, as I'm going to finish here, as you see this, and read a bit from a poem uh, by my, um, my favorite uh, poet Pablo Neruda, no me hagan caso, don't, don't make, a, make a deal or forget about me. And he says, among the things that the sea tosses up, let us hunt for the most purified, the claws of crabs, the skulls of fish, the smooth syllables of wood, small countries of mother of pearl. Let us look for what the sea undid, insistently, carelessly, what it broke up and abandoned and left behind for us. Let us look for secret things somewhere in the world, on the blue shore of silence, or where the storm has passed. There the faint signs are left, coins of time and water, debris, celestial ash, and the irreplaceable rapture of sharing in the labors of solitude and the sand. And I wish you a good trip in Uruguay, and I look forward to this cruise with you. And